Hi everyone and welcome to IBTM Connect. My name is Bryony Ireland and I'm the Marketing Manager for IBTM World. Everyone here hopes you're staying safe and well and thank you for being with us today. IBTM Connect is all about keeping you engaged and united as an industry as we work together to bring you the best possible content. Today we have Milton Rivera, VP Global Client Group, Ariana Reid, Client Strategy, and Sue Darliston, Head of Business Development UK, from American Express meetings and events. They will be discussing the eight key components that they recommend you consider within the life cycle of your virtual and hybrid meetings and events, and will be providing best practices across the end-to-end -end meetings and events management process to help you create a truly integrated and engaging experience for virtual and hybrid attendees. Thank you for being here. Stay safe. And please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ariana, Milton, and Sue. Hi, everyone. Milton Rivera here, joining you from Madrid. And I lead uh, our global client group, Bet American Express Meetings and Events. And I am joined by a couple of colleagues today, uh, Ariana and Sue. Ariana is currently trying to connect with some technical challenges. Welcome to the to the world of virtual hybrid. These are things you need to be ready for. Uh, and But uh, Sue can join us on uh, camera, I think, and introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Delighted to be here today. Um, so yeah, my name's Sue Darliston. I'm Head of Business Development, and I'm really here today talking to you around the creative content. So I'm part of the creative production division here in the UK. I'm currently sat in a sunny Stratford-upon-Avon, so um, it's nice to have great weather here, and we're looking forward to taking you through some of the content today in this virtual world. And Ariana, were you able to join us via audio? Not yet, but she's she's working on it. Uh, so together, Ariana, Sue, and myself will be conducting this masterclass, if you will, to help you understand the eight key event considerations that have been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, and these eight considerations are required to produce a highly interactive digital experience for your virtual attendees. The reality is while nothing really replaces in-person, face-to-face interactions. I think we've all lived that over the last uh, few months. Virtual hybrid meetings and events are, are still an effective way to reach a broad audience and maximize your investment. It is and it always was. Uh, at the same time, they, they provide a platform in this environment that we're in today to remain connected, engage, inform, and provide a level of inspiration uh, to your attendees. Uh, regardless of whether it's employees, customers, partners, or similar to what we're doing today in industry in general, it is important to include virtual and hybrid uh, meetings into your long-term strategy. Because um, even as we progress out of this crisis, it is clear and evident from everything that we see that uh, virtual and hybrid meetings are here to stay as a meeting and, and events uh, meetings type. Um, Again, while these events are not new in concept, they've been around for a while, you know, many companies are still having to very quickly adapt to give their audience uh, the, the type of great experience as, as, as they would from a face-to-face -face meeting or event, or, or even those that were live stream meetings or on-demand uh, content. So first of all, let's take a quick look at the different types of virtual and hybrid meeting and event formats, because it's, it's important to understand the distinguishing factors uh, amongst them. When you consider your meeting and event format, um, you, you consider it the same way you would as we've all done with our face-to-face -face meetings and events. You consider the, your, your goals, the objective of your meeting, your budget, the type line, all to help you determine which would be the best fit. Uh, it is important for you to think about the type of meeting or an event um, that you are planning and that, that it, it is suitable for a virtual hybrid environment. Uh, the, what we're learning is most meetings and events can be redesigned and adapted 
so that you can work them into these, you know, one of these three formats. However, you know, there still are some meetings and events that aren't a really great fit and might be best left or delayed to a face-to-face meeting. Things like incentives and retreats, which which require that face-to-face interaction. Now, I say that today, but, you know, crisis brings the best out of an industry and out of individuals with, uh, w- when you consider innovation and creativity. So I do not doubt that in the months to come, there will be tools and approaches that would even make these types of events somewhat uh, feasible uh, to this type of virtual hybrid uh, format. Um, from a virtual only events, uh, the reality is these virtual only events, uh, Zoom meetings, things like that require uh, the least amount of effort uh, in time because there is much less interaction. Uh, hybrid meetings require a little bit more coordination because they do require AV support in, uh, in, in one way or another. And then the hybrid multi-hub meetings require the most resources uh, because obviously they're, they're uh, more complex and they require AV in certain locations and multiple locations and there are lots of other variables uh, to consider. So uh, the key considerations, those eight key considerations that we've mentioned now a few times, uh, h- how you move your physical meeting or event to a digital version is not just a lift and shift. Uh, you have to take a step back uh, in your planning phase the same way you would create a planning phase for your face-to-face meeting. Uh, you would do so the same way for your virtual meetings and events. Uh, as you think about how you're designing it and how do you match it up with the uh, with the outcomes, all of this, the very same creativity and ingenuity that the meeting planner community in our industry has shown to to sort of bring face to face meetings and evolve them over the the years can be repackaged into a virtual environment, albeit in in very many different ways. Uh, Here are the virtual event components on the screen that we recommend you should consider within the end-to-end life cycle of a meeting and event uh, to to, to go start your way to engaging uh, and creating an engaging experience uh, for your virtual and hybrid meeting. And we'll go through each of these uh, through the discussion today in, uh, in a little bit more detail. Thank you, Milton. First, you are able and you must design, scope, and plan the right meeting experience that's in line with your goals, meeting policies, and compliance processes. It's important that you uh, identify your expected outcomes and measurements to ensure that you're meeting your objectives and goals. You must ask yourself, what behaviors do you expect after the event? and take time to think through audience personas. What key learnings do you want to take them away? And how does this translate to a virtual meeting or event? You will also want to determine your budget. Determining your budget will help you understand what you're able to achieve based on your vision. The more complex your event program, regardless if it's virtual or in person, generally greater the cost. So you'll wanna make decisions early on in terms of your expectations. Additionally, you wanna create a content strategy. The meeting's content and messaging are always the most important component, regardless for in-person or virtual events. So you'll want to think through, is your content important? Why is it important? Why does it matter? Is it timely or relevant? And you'll wanna consider your event program and if it should include multiple agenda components or items and have a clear content strategy outlined based on the full event program and allow really adequate time to build this. When you're looking at your event format, you want to be decisive. You'll need to think through uh, if your session will have a format of a fireside chat, a one-on-one interview, a solo presenter, a panel, really in a virtual environment, there are several ways and formats that you can achieve your goals and also reach your audience. You want to determine how you'll engage them, how you'll treat the content, and think about that early on 
as that will have a much more successful outcome. And determining how long the event will be based on the relevance of the content to the audience. So knowing your audience will be key. For example, if, you're a t if your employees um, might be attending an internal virtual event, you might want to be able to capture their attention for a longer period of time. Really, either way, for events with a full program or multiple days, you should be able to include breakout sessions and have opportunities to step away from the computer. Uh, that is a huge factor for virtual events, as you can imagine, having a long event over a series of days or a full day agenda program, having opportunities to step away from the computer and have breaks in between are important, just as they are important for face-to-face -face meetings. And if you in introduce a live studio setup for a plenary host or a keynote speaker, this can also create a high production value experience. You'll also want to identify speakers. Since virtual meetings are usually less expensive than in-person ones, you might want to be able to, you might want to be able to invest more in phenomenal speakers. With any format that you choose, it's important that your speakers are engaging to capture and retain the interest of the audience as you won't have really the bells and whistles of a live event with staging and production and other elements. And lastly, you'll need to schedule your event. Uh, with a virtual event uh, and attendees not flying in in person, you'll need to make sure you have consideration of different time zones and allow adequate time for the content development and preparation according to your event program. Technology assessment and procurement is a critical component to the, this process. This helps you determine solutions that you'll need to achieve your goals. You can either use existing technology, and there are several out there, or deploy new solutions that may be aligned with your meeting goals and your budget. There are a wealth of platforms out there to host virtual and hybrid meetings as that's become the new normal. So it's important to select a platform that's aligned with your goals. Some platforms offer an expansive feature list that might be unnecessary if your meeting's goal is just to educate and measure attendees' comprehension. Either also, alternatively, if your goal is to inspire or deliver an unforgettable experience, you want to make sure your platform that you choose and the services enable that wow factor. Some platforms can support the content, such as videos, better than others, so you'll need to do your research. And working through whether it's a standard web conference or a web conference with attendee management or how you uh, weave in a mobile app, which is a key component, webcasts or trade show, you'll need to make sure that you do the research and carefully evaluate your options before deploying a platform that may not have all the components or may have way more than you require. Your content, your timeline, the network infrastructure, they all play into your choice, as well as the bandwidth and the internet connectivity. That is crucial um, to ensure you have a successful virtual event. So make sure you conduct testing to avoid technical glitches and have a contingency plan in case of any issues. Um, you'll want to really decide also if you will live stream or you'll create on-demand content. Live stream or on-demand content can create two entirely different experiences. So it's important to align on that format and your platform early on. As with in-person events, we recommend really creating a theme and a visual identity that's in line with your strategy. You can then apply the event identity across all supporting content and communications. Virtual and hybrid meetings don't have to mean death by PowerPoint. This is a great opportunity where we can be creative and you can be creative with your content. Either that's weaving in videos, music, to impactful graphic design. There are several ways that you can make a digital event more visually appealing. So consider some portion of your audience if they may be viewing the event on a mobile device, the graphics will need to be adapted for that format. Also think through like, the slide content 
and the text. Limited text and clear large graphics may help to convey your message in a more clear and concise format. Also using animations, you can confirm if your platform are able to accommodate them as they add another visual effect to help the professionalism and also um, greater experience for your audience. And uh, if, if I could uh, let everyone know I, uh, for, for questions, if you have questions as we're going along, feel free to uh, type them in. Uh, yes. Appropriately, we're going to collect, we're going to answer all the questions that we've captured through the chats uh, at the at the end. We left, we've left ample time uh, to do that. So just want to, as the questions come up in your mind, feel free to type them in. Thank you, Milton. Appreciate that. Great. You'll also want to really map the attendee journey across all touch points. It's important to think about the attendee journey throughout the life cycle of the event and determine those touch points. There should be no difference in this process if it were a live event and really analyze what would have made the difference or what would have made your audience excited about attending the event and work out how this can be replicated virtually. So really mapping out every channel throughout the journey to engage the audience, whether this is through marketing the event or thinking about the first communication of a website or invitation or registration process, you'll be able to maximize and track attendance while giving your audience a far greater digital experience. Great. We're just coming on now to talk about the actual preparation side of things. So I just want to reiterate a couple of key messages that have been played out so far. Um, from a content perspective, ensure that you really are designing that content for a virtual environment. Don't replicate uh, what you would have done in that real world. Ensure, as Ariana mentioned earlier on, that it is absolutely fit for purpose and that you are clearly defining those objectives. And clearly use tools where it's appropriate to do so. So, for example, if you're gathering an opinion, maybe use a poll. If you're wanting to post a reminder or a link, then maybe use chat. Um, or if you're doing any type of brainstorming functionality, then the possibility of sort of whiteboard content. I think the other thing as well from a content management is, is ensuring that you are using sort of visual tips when you're transitioning through different components. So what I mean by that is that in the lack of sort of those visual cues that you get in the um, sort of face-to-face -face environment, they're not present in virtual meetings. So if you are looking for people to do some sort of poll, you need to clearly articulate what's expected of them and, and sort of almost take them through that journey so that they can see um, sort of the use, um, how to use the sort of functionality there. Um, the other sort of key component here is, is utilising the right sort of tools, whether that be sort of virtual showrooms, utilising sponsorship, uh, sponsor spaces. Um, and again, just looking at things like d digital badges. I think Ariana mentioned it, that that content piece and the design is really important and how that plays out through the duration of the virtual environment and the virtual sort of process. From a preparation perspective, what does that sort of really mean? Um, like you would in a face-to-face -face environment, it's, it's really crucial that the speakers are fully prepped. So you need to make sure that in advance there's enough time to sort of go through that content. I think now uh, the virtual world is slightly new for different people and delivery of messages can be different. So you need to allow time to prepare people in order to make sure that that delivery works seamlessly or as seamlessly as possible in, in this, sort of, um, this sort of medium. And it's important that whoever's participating, as you would expect, obviously is clear on the content and, and can be agile in terms of the requirements as they go through that process. 
Just moving then on to the uh, technology and the support functions, I think it's really critical to differentiate different support elements that are available. So it could be that um, sort of the AV side, so looking at that technology support to make sure that any glitches are mitigated as much as possible, or it could be the support of a, pro a producer that actually can help with content and, and designing that delivery um, of the whole sort of event itself. So I'm sure we've all had experiences and, and we had one earlier today where there's a glitches in terms of um, technology. So you can and it's it's really important that you do have as many run throughs as, as possible, but you also need to be prepared for any eventualities and have various backup plans. When it comes to producers, um, really in terms of the actual content that you're designing, whether it's highly interactive content, we'd probably recommend that if anything over sort of 25 attendees with highly interactive engagement strategies as part of the virtual meeting, that there is some sort of producer that's involved as well as maybe some technology support to ensure that everything's running seamlessly and sort of managed as part of the process. So we've talked about the, the run throughs and, and how important that those are. So uh, prior testing, so things like Wi-Fi speeds, having the green screens behind if you're creating any type of virtual backdrop. backdrop. Uh, we have had instances where we've actually had to ship laptops with inbuilt Wi-Fi out to various speakers because their local or their, their uh, Wi-Fi capabilities weren't really of the level that was required for a particular function. So we need to ensure that there's proper planning uh, for all of these eventualities. Um, and then we'd say at least a week before you, you do this sort of the, the training with those speakers, but more about the functionality. So how they manage slide transition, how they were dealing with questions, what's the actual process um, for, for the day. Um, and then prior actually on the day, at least 30 minutes before, um, log on as you would expect to make sure that everything's running smoothly and everybody's online as they, as they should be. So just moving on to the uh, attendee experience. So um, encouragement of attendee participation engagement is absolutely key. And we need to make sure that every event is engaging and personalised as much as possible. Um, we need to make sure that, that we're trying to minimise sort of distraction. And we recommend that every sort of three to four slides, there's maybe some engagement content to really keep motivation high. And that might be a poll. It might be um, some sort of uh, chat um, information that's that's come through so I think the key thing to remember and build into any uh, um, design of a virtual meeting is to make sure that you're really agile as well that you have various components that are built into the content that if for example you are seeing there's maybe a wane um, in sort of the energy and the engagement that you have something that you can bring into the actual content itself. And you can utilize sort of breaks to reevaluate how the meeting's going and reevaluate whether that's sort of that's sort of needed. So make sure that's part of the, um, the, the process. So we really encourage that we utilize all of the functionality and it depends on what your objectives are. So whether that's sort of chat functions, whether it's polls, whether it's gamification where appropriate to make sure that the messages are, are really clear. But I guess no matter what sort of event format, um, one of the areas that works particularly well alongside um, just a standard virtual meeting is mobile devices. The use of mobile devices can really support the content and give various different mediums. Again, that keeps that engagement um, process alive. Um, we've used examples of um, sort of for a beauty client um, that, that was doing a sort of a product product launch. We've actually also sent um, examples of that, that samples of those products to the individual participants. Um, and that's been uh, organized as well with some live demos to actually use the actual products that they've received. So bringing different components into it really, really also helps drive and keep that engagement and different touch points alive. 
And um, the other thing that we've done is created sort of reading rooms um, and reading rooms can be done um, and achieved through this mobile apps so that you're getting materials pre and post event. Um, and so, again, it just makes sure that that messaging is coming through. The one thing as well is, um, as always in any meeting, whether it be virtual or in um, a face to face environment, soliciting feedback is hugely important. So polls are obviously a way to get that client engagement um, or it could be sort of um, through the Q&A. Um, all of that co component is really important to make sure that we are looking at ways to improve this environment for, for the next time we do a meeting. And then moving on to the last sort of part of our wheel, looking at the actual results stage. So there's so much um, information that's available um, in a virtual world. And depending on the content that you put together, you will have solicita solicited various different elements uh, where some engagement has been made. And it's important that you capture all of that and make sure that you save all of those exchanges so that everything that you've got, whether it be through Q&A, poll results, whether it be through chat exchange, is actually saved so that you can look back upon everything that was discussed and run through and then you can provide um, sort of feedback. One of the components um, that's really imperative is to make sure there is a, an element that follows up after the actual um, virtual session itself. So in order to stay connected with your audience, uh, we recommend sort of follow up emails or blogs or some sort of communication strategy that leaves some breeze sort of after the event to make sure that all of those areas that were talked about are fresh in everybody's minds. So there's a lot of information that's available to everybody. And now we're just going to bring that to life through a case study that Ariana is just going to take us through. Thanks, Ariana. Thanks, Sue. So this is a case study, and I see a lot of questions actually coming through in the Q&A about how we can use different elements of production, how to engage. This is a great case study that shows how we were able to support one of our uh, pharmaceutical clients for a virtual hybrid event. Uh, it was for an investigator meeting, a fairly large meeting with regional attendees from regional locations in Asia PAC, in Latin America, and within Europe. It was a two-day event um, with three sessions or four sessions. Um, there was an opportunity to develop a event identity and design based off of the content uh, for the investigator meeting. Uh, they used the ability to have attendee registration given the amount of attendees that were attending. So building a web, web registration and uh, registration site was very important for this client in order to capture the attendees coming from various regions. Additionally, um, there was the ability to live stream given the content needing to be um, streamed to different regions and different offices. Um, also, there was support for speakers. Uh, there were speakers who were delivering content to a broader audience and the ability to include a mobile app. So this really had all of the bells and whistles that you can have for a virtual event. And some of the approach really was having really the support from a production perspective uh, for this client to ensure that it was successful given all of those components. Um, being able to track the participants and the attendees and having some pre-event pre communications for those attendees was key in the success of the program. They were engaged from beginning to end. Also having Q&A sessions um, after, as we will in this session, was really important to engage uh, with the attendees. And really the outcome drove that level of engagement, being able to deliver content to various, various audiences in various regions and still have what usually typically is a fairly large a uh, face-to-face event in a virtual and hybrid ability. So this is a great uh, example of how uh, we were able to support. And there, it really varies on the client objectives as we talked to earlier, on what they're trying to achieve, the audience um, and the format to really drive success for an event such as this. Thank you. And I'll pass it over to Milton. Yes. And, uh... 
So before we move on to questions, we, we thought it might be good to there's a lot of information in a short period of time just to summarize uh, a, a bit the eight considerations that we've shared with you today and, and add you know some anecdotal context. Uh, so if we, if we go quickly down the list and I won't go through all of them, but you know definitely want to impart some insight on on, on a few of them. So program uh, design scope and plan uh, if in in our past pre-COVID uh, world, uh, we we took into consideration as a meetings and events community uh, the objective of the meeting, what that program was going to look like uh, on a pathway to that objective, what that design, what the scope, all of those things that we did previously. The thinking around it still uh, remains, and, and first and foremost. I think that's one of the, as, as I've had these conversations with uh, different clients and members of our, of our industry, uh, it is important to keep ourselves grounded in our profession to understand that this is still the foundation of understanding what you want to accomplish for a meeting and taking a step back and begin and begin to design uh, that program and what the scope and plan is. Um, obviously, the component parts are going to be different. We highlighted some of those in, in today's conversations, but uh, you don't want to lose sight of that because, you know, what, what could easily happen is this focus on the, the second com uh, consideration of technology could become and is in some cases becoming the first forefront. Like, uh, I want to have a virtual hybrid meeting. What is the technology they're going to use? So technology has been part of our sort of program design for many years, right? Uh, with the advent of AV at venues and mobile apps. And, you know, what did we do with those technologies? We incorporated them into our end-to-end -end planning design. It's no different with what we have to do uh, for virtual hybrid meetings. The technology is an absolute key component um, in many aspects, it almost sort of loosely takes the place of the venue, you know, uh, in, in the experience, right? Because in, in these events, there's no venue. So the part that is closest to the attendee, what they can touch and feel, is the technology. So it is an absolute core part, but the technology is only as good as and only as strong and only as capable is how you plug it into your overall design and, and strategy and choose those right technologies in, in accordance uh, to that. Um, the, the last couple of things I'll, I'll close out on is um, we've spent over the last few years, and, and we've done uh, talk tracks on this and, and papers on understanding your attendee to, to the point where the last few years we talked about understanding your attendee personas and, and who they are and, and, and lots of work in our industry uh, had surfaced around how do you engage attendees in, in this world? What type of behavioral science is there to engage people at face-to-face -face events? Uh, some, some new ways to engage will come out of virtual and hybrid. We know some already, some things that don't port over well that you need to change when you, you transition your face-to-face -face meeting to a virtual hybrid. There will be others. There will be the more virtual hybrid meetings we do, the more observation we have of what works for attendees and what works better. And we will begin to get information from the industry the very same way we got them before around what does behavior, uh, a high level of engaging behavior look like for a virtual hybrid attendee. Uh, it, it will continue to happen. So uh, keep yourself informed, keep yourself, keep your finger on the, on the pulse of what, what's, uh, what's going on in the industry. It's gonna be very evolving. In many cases, it's very exciting, right? Because this is a, a new addition to our suite of uh, of meeting types of meeting uh, professionals. Uh, so, uh, so with that, um, I think it's a good time to port over to some of the questions that we have uh, queued up. So Sue is, uh, is going to be our uh, facilitator of the questions. And uh, um, I'll mention this now and I'll mention it at the closing. Uh, if there's any questions we don't get to or any questions that you're here or that you wanna do with us, please feel free 
to contact uh, Anastasia. The contact is on the screen. Uh, and you know she can put you in contact with someone who can answer your questions or can engage in, uh, in further conversation. Thanks, Milton. Um, yeah, just wanted to sort of say it, it's been amazing um, going through this the amount of questions that have, come, that have come through. So really want to um, sort of thank everybody for a really active sort of session. As Milton said, we'll try and get through as many as possible. So um, we'll, we'll cover these questions. Those that we don't get to, uh, we will be sending out uh, sort of follow up um, information so we can inclu include all of the information for everybody uh, and share that out to, to all the participants. Uh, a number of people are asking whether this copy of this presentation will be um, available. So um, we will sort of have this available um, to share. And I un also understand there will be a copy of this actual session itself being shared. Um, so um, th there will be information to follow on that you can revisit for this side. So just wanted to mention that before we move on to some more technical questions. Um, one of the queries here is around um, which webinar tool are we currently using for today? So this is um, a bright talk. This is actually um, IBTM's technology platform. Um, and so this is sort of a, a standard webinar platform. Um, I know there's lots of questions here around technology. So um, Ariana Milton, could we perhaps just give an, um, an overview of some of the technology that we utilize and, and for what for everybody? Uh, sure. I think Ariana, are you still on? Yes, I am here. Hello. Maybe you'll kick it off and I'll, I'll follow suit. Sure. So we definitely utilize um, uh, virtual platforms that provide either webcast or um, standard web conference in addition to mobile apps. So um, I know we are, we have talked about a couple of those formats. You know, we it's dependent on our client objectives and needs really about how we utilize either a standard web conference tool or something similar to what we're doing right now for on-demand web, webinar, or uh, we have used uh, more production partners to provide what we consider a true webcast or webinar. So those are the types of, of technologies that we utilize and we platforms that we have used are, you know, to, to name uh, educational measures. Um, you know, we have been able to, to utilize in that case study on 24. I think that was a, a question that came across. It really is dependent on the type of program, the format, the audience, uh, really that is the key uh, components that really dr drive the decision on what platform is used. And, and also with regards to technology, you know, there's you know several technologies and, and many of the technology partners are evolving very quickly. As we have conversations with customers, particularly corporations, many of them have had what we would call virtual technology sitting on the shelf, probably uh, unused for the most part, for except for a few occasions. I think a lot of them were were, were brought in and developed for training and professional services training. Uh, however, some of those technologies, you know, we are having discussions on whether, what other features do they have to sort of bring into, depending on the meeting type, uh, the virtual meeting type that is, where they be brought into the mix and then supplemented by other technologies. The idea here is, is finding the right mix of technologies, ultimately to fit into your plan and design mm -hmm. for the highest level of engagement of your attendees, right? So that should be the end game is what is that uh, engagement for your attendees and then work, work backwards. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so another sort of question, do you have any recommendations for durations and times? Uh, a virtual event is available globally. Is it better to repeat live content two or three times for everyone? Or do you recommend choosing the best region or just having it be on demand for everyone else? Sure, and I, and I can answer that. Really, it depends on the content um, that you're driving. You know, for a training session, what we've seen you know, it's it is it does it does make sense to either cover three different time zones and maybe repeat that content, just because you want that content delivered from a um, training perspective to be um, straightforward and effective. And also, um, oftentimes we see our clients are uh, looking to have sessions regionally focused, and the content may be driven by that. 
So it really depends on the content, um, but the durations, what we have seen, it's, it's also dependent on the format. Um, if you are having a training session, if you're having a webinar, um, again, it really, the content drives that decision on the duration and time. And, and again, not a new challenge for us. It's a new challenge in this in this virtual environment. But you know, over the years, we too struggled with how long should a breakout meeting take? How long <laughs> should a session take? You know, how long do you keep people sort of locked in a in a room? Right. So some of those same uh, learnings from each meeting will will come in. And what were the answers to those? That you know, if you kept them really engaged, you can keep them in the room all day. But if you didn't have engaging content, you know, you'd be losing people in 30 minutes. So same, you know, general concept applies. Okay. Thank you both. So the next question is, uh, what are you, the unique challenges in having an at-home stable of speakers? Can you actually have production um, completed remotely? And should different types of content have different levels of production? So I'll start off maybe answering um, some of that and then anybody else um, just feel free to interject afterwards. But I think that the key thing is that a lot of us are currently in um, working from home. So the reality is that we need to make sure that we are utilizing the best speakers and whether that be from home um, in the current environment, then that can still be achieved. Um, we can still do sort of technology and AV support remotely. So people can dial into the content and the the technology sort of consultant can be able to support that so it absolutely can still be done the production uh, component is more of a design sort of content delivery function. So the, the producer would, would be uh, very much involved in some of the design uh, components right at the very start. And it will be more of the technology support that will be able to help you um, from, from a support functionality. Anything mm -hmm. else to add, um, Ariana or Milton? Yes, I, I have seen also uh, production companies provide equipment to your home office. So there might be the ability to provide lighting or another external webcam so that you can have that higher production value. Um, so that is definitely a, another option if the speaker at home is not equipped with that type of technology or that type of equipment. So that's another layer that can help to provide a professional experience and quality. Great. The other thing we'll, we'll we find, and actually this is you know one of the positives of a virtual hybrid is it does allow us to reach a much broader audience, an expanded audience than we maybe would have reached through an in-person uh, meeting because of cost or you know geographic limitations. And and as we expand those, you know, it does sort of present some new challenges slash opportunities. And one of the ones we've seen uh, either for training or the like is the fact that as is a virtual meeting can explore can expand into different regions simultaneously. Uh, the interpretation uh, and the translation technologies that were starting to come to the forefront over the last couple of years have found a sweet spot in this uh, virtual world. So there's uh, there's a few organizations that are out there that have plugged uh, plugged in to help with simultaneous uh, translation uh, for, for those individuals that would, uh, in the comfort of their home, would like to hear it in their own language. Thanks, Milton. Um, this is a, a really great question, and I think it's really, really important to, to sort of mention it. Um, so uh, there's a comment here that they agree, they agree on engagement, but there isn't any here today. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that we um, sort of acknowledge that. Um, in terms of the technology platform that we're using, um, it's it, Bright Talk functionality is one of sharing information. Um, and that's the sort of the platform that we are using based on the IBTM um, sort of engagement plan. So I, I completely agree. This is more of a delivery content. And typically you would have areas in where there is, is more engagement. Um, but this comes back to sort of the, uh, the availability of tools and what you're sharing information on in terms of platforms. So uh, next question here, um, how is the app experience different? Normally it would be a navigation tool. So how is it being used other than as a portal to the virtual platform? So Ariana, would you be able to just maybe talk through that sort of the, the mobile app component and how it can support an event? 
Sure. So the mobile app um, and many of mobile apps today, uh, there's a name of one, Attendify, where there is an ability to not only have, as I mentioned before, engagement pre-event, so ability for attendees to get uh, information about the event. So posting in um, some pre-communication, some documentation, some maybe even for a training meeting prep work, um, and also the ability just to really engage and g gain, gather excitement before the event. But in addition um, to just gathering information and having um, the engagement, there are also virtual components with mobile apps. So you're able to even manage the actual virtual event um, utilizing a mobile app technology. And that really changes the game because you're able to encompass the a virtual experience within one platform. Again, dependent on the content, everything is not going to be conducive for that, but it really allows for the event, uh, pre-event engagement and communication. So sending out uh, materials, invitation, uh, speaker bio information, and then actually live event um, uh, engagement as well. And then you can also have post-event engagement where you follow through with uh, questions in it that were answered, additional content, have gamification as well, you know, ask, um, have a leaderboard for points if someone answers a particular question or so someone is able to post um, their opinion about a particular session. You're able to, uh, to do a lot of different things that can engage the attendees throughout the entire life cycle. So really prior, uh, before the event, during the event and post the event and keeping the engagement um, throughout that period. So that's really where a mobile app can help um, enhance a virtual event. Thanks, sorry. And I don't know if you wanna add anything, um, Milton or Sue. No, no, I, I think you hit it on the head. It is just one of an additional tool where the equipment is readily available for any attendee, no matter where they are in the world, that being their mobile phone. And you could use it as a way to engage, right? And uh, and that and that's what that's all about, is taking the engagement. It's needed, actually, if everyone recalls the, the migration of uh, mobile apps, right? It started as a way to uh, get rid of agendas and those door drops. Um, back in the day, I'm probably dating myself. But, uh, but then it turned into a very critical engagement tool in these, those in-person meetings. And I think the mobile apps have, have now found even a greater place and it's a greater tool in, in a virtual hybrid environment to, to play an engagement role. Thanks, Milton. Um, the next question, I'm going to uh, bat back to you, Milton, if that's OK. So uh, do you think that after COVID, we'll organise the events as before or we'll organise them in a virtual or hybrid way? Can you give an opinion? I think it'll it'll be a mix. Face to face meetings will uh, will come back. Uh, I think uh, in the short term, the virtual hybrid meetings it'll progress from virtual to hybrid uh, over time as we you know move through that uh, that new normal. But when face to face meetings come back again, I've seen the the conversations and the evolving um, history of virtual meetings. It will be here to stay because it it finally has caught up with where the attendee expectation is. And the reality is, COVID aside, our attendee population and those personas were actually looking for more virtual engagement opportunities, right? There's demographics out there that, you know, might not prefer to spend the time traveling you know, 10 hours of a day to an event for three days and then another 10 hours back. So I think it, 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 it's come to fruition uh, at a high level for a particular reason, but it will stay on permanently for, for others. Thank you. Um, the next one, Ariana, I'll, I'll sort of throw to you. Um, are you also working on 3D conferences? So three, for 3D conferences, um, yes. So we're seeing a lot more requests for um, trade shows and conferences. So um, we are working with uh, some 3D conferences. Not a majority of what we've been seeing are the standard web conferences, as I mentioned before. Um, but as we see more trade shows is where that is the area that would have a 3D con conference or use that technology. And as we are starting to see some of those um, go virtual, that's where um, 
we're seeing that interest. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. There's a question here about data. So uh, what do you think about the data you're able to collect through virtual events, Ariana? Sure. So as I just talked about, um, really engagement. Um, so with some of the platforms and technology, you are able to um, introduce polling questions uh, throughout the session um, that you might want to share post. Um, you are also, some apps are able to, and apps or uh, platforms are able to track the participation, participation in a session, notes, um, and that you have the ability to be able to consolidate that information and share that post event, share that during the event, polling results um, during the event. It's really dependent on driven on the content and the uh, features that are utilized and, and how you can um, consolidate the information for the audience. But it's very helpful because it helps to drive further engagement even post and also form maybe content for a future virtual event or session. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting question here. Um, how do you envisage a venue could utilize technology to continue to host events for external clients? So coming at it from a slightly different perspective. So any thoughts on that? So for a venue, if I can understand correctly, so for a venue to host uh, in to be part of a virtual hybrid event, yes. Yeah, yeah I think it's really critical. Because when we talk about virtual, particularly when we talk about virtual um, hybrid, multi-hub hybrid, it does involve a venue. Now, that venue could very well be a hotel. And as we move forward, it is likely going to be a hotel uh, or a hotel-type venue with a you know, small number of people and multiple ones around the world, or it could be uh, in an office or, uh, uh, or or the like. But the reality is that there is a place for hotels in this virtual hybrid meeting. It may not be the large sort of ballroom uh, approach we're accustomed to, but as we look at multi-hubs, um, the hotels have the majority of the facility and infrastructure to do that. Some of them will just have to upgrade some of their uh, technology and, uh, and, and and broadband to, to accommodate it. But the reality is they're poised very well. They're centrally located, many of them. Uh, they have all the other accommodations to, to service that group for a full day. So they do have a big part to play. Uh, over the next months, I think, uh, the next month, as the hotels are redefining what their role is, not only on the transient side, but on the meeting side, uh, some of it is really core, like, you know, how do they get people checked in and, and these, this will be a part of it as well. What is, what is their meeting side of the house? How are they going to adjust and pivot uh, to, to what's needed? And, and we've had discussions, brainstorming sessions with, uh, with uh, some of the hotel community and, uh, and they were on it. Thank you. Um, Ariana, just a question for you. How do you fix bandwidth issues? Sure. So a lot of it is dependent on, especially when you're working with internal meetings, your uh, VPN and your internal infrastructure. You know, a lot of times um, it's really testing practice, 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 practice. Also determining um, if there are different ways that have better audience um, or better uh, quality. So uh, we have seen, you know, to disconnect VPN in order to have uh, better bandwidth or better quality. It's it's really dependent from a straight virtual event to on the infrastructure that uh, you have or the speakers or the audience may have. Now, if you uh, have a, a hybrid um, event, you know, again, the bandwidth can be tested within the venue that you are utilizing. Um, and what we have found over and over again, especially with virtual and hybrid, is the ability to practice, the ability to understand where how you are able to test and to get the best quality. It is a very can be a very tricky <laughs> situation with bandwidth because it is uh, required. You know, depending on your attendees, they may be joining from a mobile device, or they may be joining from a personal device, or they may be joining from a um, a work um, provided device. So it is, uh, it can be a challenge, but what we have found is understanding the best practices, communicating that upfront and providing various options for your attendees to be able to view your content, whether virtual or in a hybrid setting. I think what we've also learned is you could test, you could practice. Mm -hmm. 
then when the time comes, because you know bandwidth uh, goes up and down depending on the moment, is to have a plan B, have a plan that you know would assume what happens if you know a key speaker's connection goes out, or uh, you know a, a key provider of information goes out, or your attendees go out, right? So uh, so having a plan B is really Thank you. Um, another one, Milton, to, to yourself. Can you expand a little bit more on what it means, what you mean by a hybrid multi-hub format? So if we can just go back to that and expand a little more. Thank sure. you. So a hybrid uh, multi, so hybrid, just to start with the basic is some people are connected virtually and some people are in a particular location, singular. Uh, multi-hub is that you have multiple groups of people could be around the world uh, gathered in separate locations that are all connected and then they're all connected to people who are who are virtual or not right you could just be multi-hub and that that's the end of it but likely what we've seen is the multi-location so a group of 20 people in london a group of 15 people in new york a group of 10 people in madrid and those people are all connected all part of the same meeting and in addition to that, there are people dialed in uh, from their virtual locations as well. That is uh, that is a multi-hub. So you can imagine it could take a multitude of variations, and hence that's why we said that format could be uh, somewhat more complex because it has a lot of uh, a lot of variables to it. But but also to the point, it has a lot of flexibility. You can, you know, when you get to designing, you can design in a lot of different ways and, and mm -hmm. uh, touch people in, uh, in, in more ways than, uh, than even before. Yeah, and just to add on that, you can really look at, and we are seeing our clients break down their training meetings into regions or into districts that way, into that type of environment. So again, the flexibility is great there. You're able to still have a you know large event and um, segment it out into different offices, different regions, different districts. Again, this is the ability and the beauty of a, of a hybrid event. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. We've just got um, four minutes remaining, so we'll just get through as many as we can. Um, how do you manage Q&A and live polling in multiple languages? Ariana, is that one that you can talk to? Sure. So you, first, you must um, work with a translation or an interpretation um, company. We have utilized in Interpretnet uh, before for that. So that's important to um, align on that upfront and the number of languages. Now, um, in a there are platforms and technology that can um, answer and provide that translation of those polling questions. It's going to be dependent on when you have um, the polling, either uh, during the event, or you can also um, have translation of materials as well after. You have to think of all the components where that translation is required, but we, you are able to do that with um, polling and questions using a translation service. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we'll just put the last sort of couple of questions in. So um, have you seen AR or VR added as a component to a virtual conference and maybe expand on on that slightly? Ariana? I have I have not um, quite yet, but I could understand. I, I can imagine that we will not. I think that will be, again, an added component. Um, you know, we are starting to see um, our clients ask for, you know, more complex features, how to enhance their program. And I think we'll see more and more of that um, as another feature for a virtual conference or event. Yeah, we will, I think, start to, we, we were just starting to see it in live events, right, mm -hmm. over the last uh, 12 months. And I think we'll see an extension of that. I think we'll probably see it just because of the investment that it still is. We will likely start to see it in um, uh, the hybrid mode or the the multi hub, whereas one of those many in person locations that I mentioned could there could be someone uh, who's not at one any of those hubs who plugs into those and then the virtual. So again, the the uh, opportunities are limitless in that in that sense. Okay, 
Okay. Um, and then I'll use this as the sort of the last question um, just as we close. But what do you what would you recommend to ensure or allow um, from a networking perspective during a virtual or multi hybrid um, sort of event? So any recommendations regarding the actual networking component? So I. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I, I think, as I mentioned before, it's really the, there's an ability to network prior um, to the event. And we have found that successful through um, utilizing, excuse me, a, a mobile event or excuse me, a mobile app. So you are able to have that engagement uh, prior. And then also during um, having that get engagement is also um, possible. You, either that's, you know, through, again, um, polling or doing a team building. We have seen also some suggestions on virtual team buildings and uh, networking or going into different breakout sessions within platform to and, and composing those with uh, different groups in order to engage networking. There are various ways that you're able to do that either um, before the event to drive it also during the event. So um, it's great, great opportunity to be able to do that. Great. Well, that concludes the session today. We're just at the top of the hour. So if there are any further questions, then don't hesitate to contact um, any of us via, via the email just shown on the website. And as I mentioned, further content will be delivered. Thank you all uh, for, for joining and uh, for taking your valuable time. More to come on this, not only from us, but you know, stay tuned in the industry. This is in a an evolving approach. I think we're moving from reacting with virtual hybrid solutions to now starting to move towards taking this tool and actually creating something new and, and different uh, in our industry. And I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. Great. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Take, Take care. care.